Welcome to the PA Books podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. While the focus is always on Pennsylvania, topics like the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Gettysburg, the Industrial Revolution, the coal and steel industries, and authors like John Updike, David McCullough, and John Grogan have a universal appeal. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This week on PA Books, the author of Murder in the Stacks, David DeCoke. David DeCook, author of Murder in the Stacks, Penn State, Betsy Ardsma, and the Killer Who Got Away. This book is about a murder that happened in 1969. What was it about it that made you want to sit down now and write a book about it? Well, it's an enduring mystery uh, in Pennsylvania, especially among Penn State graduates. There are very few graduates uh, since then who don't know at least a little something about it. Now, what they know is often wrong, but they've heard something about this girl that was killed in the library. Uh, and, and so they... Uh, you know, they, they, they fear, heard all these rumors and, and all that, and they use it as a kind of an urban legend to scare incoming freshmen. Uh, but it was very true, you know. And, and the other thing, of course, was that she was from my hometown in Michigan, Holland, Michigan. Uh, we went to the same high school. Uh, we had several teachers in common. Uh, uh, she was six years older than me, so I didn't know her. But, you know, like my sister, my younger sister is, is Facebook friends with her younger sister, you know. So there's a, there's a lot of ties there. I grew up in Holland. She grew up in Holland. Uh, my parents went to Hope College. Uh, her parents went to Hope College. So our upbringings were not dissimilar. Well, how do you piece together a story like this after 40-plus years? Well, it's not, it's not always easy. Uh, in some of my past books, I've depended a lot on, on documents. But in, in this case, um, the documents that should be there at Penn State, you know, which probably should be like, like about this many documents, literally, are nowhere to be found. Uh, there's a tiny little folder in the archives, mostly press releases, uh, and that is the sum total of Penn State's available documents you know, on the case. And with the state police, under Pennsylvania law, you can't get access to uh, criminal uh, investigation records. Uh, and uh, so... What I did was I, I had to depend on interviews, and especially with Sergeant George Keebler, who was the original investigator of the Ardsma uh, murder. He's now, I believe, 84 years old, uh, still in very good health, very good memory. Uh, and we, we had you know, seven or eight long, good you know, interviews over a, a two-year period. And, and then there were other uh, state uh, troopers who were very, very helpful. Uh, Mike Simmers, who lives up in Perry County, uh, he retired as a captain, but at the, the time of the Ardsma murder, he was a young trooper, just 23 years old. He was the first state trooper on the scene uh, after the state police learned of, of the murder. And then, um, although the Ardsma family, for their own you know, reasons, did not choose to, uh, to talk to me, uh, most of them anyway, um, all of her friends did. Uh, you know, her closest friends from high school, you know, Hope College, University of Michigan, Penn State, they all talk to me uh, sometimes, you know, for a long time, you know, on more than one occasion. And through them, I was able to, you know, piece together, you know, uh, an accurate picture of who Betsy Arisma was. You know, so it, that's how I did it. Plus, you know, the news coverage of, of the events at the time, uh, you know, but mainly it was those interviews uh, that helped me tell this story. So you have a background as an investigative reporter. Yes, uh, I was an investigative reporter for the Patriot News in Harrisburg here uh, for almost 21 years, uh, mainly covering you know business and environmental you know type topics. You know, so this was not something new to me. So you're used to calling people up and saying, identifying yourself and saying, "I want to talk to you about a murder that took place 40 years ago." That's right. Uh, that's what I did, uh, and uh, and sometimes they would shut you down, but other times you know they would talk and, and tell you uh, you know what they knew to the extent that they could. You know, and I never minded if they, if, if, if they just told me, like, one good thing. In fact, that's my, my theory, is that everybody knows one good story about somebody they know. You know, and, uh, and you just have to talk to them long enough to pull that, that out of them. And, and through a lot of those interviews and a lot of those good little facts, you know, you can put together a very, 
you know, distinctive narrative, you know, about the people that you're writing about. So you're able to put together a biography of someone who wasn't very famous? That's right, uh, and, and that's what I did. I wrote a biography of, uh, of Betsy Arzma, and I wrote a biography of her, the man who was the most likely killer of her, uh, Richard Hafner from Lancaster. Was there any point that you had poured hours into this and thought, I'm not going to get enough for a book out of this? No, I never, I never really thought that. Uh, now, actually, that's not true. Initially, uh, in 2008, I wrote a two-part uh, series for the Patriot News uh, about the case. It was the last thing I, uh, I wrote before I took the buyout, along with a lot of my colleagues there. Uh, and uh, and at that, after I had finished that, at that point, Richard Hafner had not come to light. And, uh, and so it was just, it was kind of like an interesting story about a, uh, an unsolved, you know, murder. But I really, at that point, didn't think there was necessarily a, a book in it. But that changed in the summer of 2010 when uh, the investigator, at, who at that time was assigned to the case, uh, told the Yardsma family that she believed that the case had been solved, although there would never be an arrest because uh, Hafner had been dead since 2002. And... Uh, Kathy uh, Arzma, uh, her younger sister, happened to be going to a high school class reunion in Holland uh, in August of, of 2010. She told several friends uh, there uh, uh, that the case had been solved. One of them at the beauty shop the next day told her, her hairdresser you know, about this, and that hairdresser was the sister of, of one of my sources, one of Bessie's close friends, and I got an email that day uh, from the sister uh, you know, telling me about this, and then I, I said, oh, this, this is fascinating, and I, I jumped into it, you know, as a book and never looked back. There was still an investigator assigned to the case 40 years later? Oh, there still is today, you know, but uh, they don't do much. I mean, uh, if you called them up and asked, they would say, oh, yeah, it's still an open case. But, but the fact is that uh, many of the original investigators uh, and you know, and the current, and the one who was the current, uh, Lieutenant, or Lee Barrows, Trooper Lee Barrows, they thought that Hafner, you know, it was, he was the one, you know, and, but there was always a school of thought that's, that looked at another student, uh, a guy whose last name was Maurer, and, uh, and they, even as late as 2007, uh, there were discussions between uh, the state police and the Center County District Attorney about convening a grand jury, you know, to look at Maurer. Uh, but they never happen because there's always been a lot of smoke, but no fire there, you know. But Maurer, in fact, you know, displayed some, some strange behaviors, almost taunting the state police into believing that he was the suspect. And, uh, you know, like, like uh, carving into his desk at Penn State, here sits death in the guise of man. And, you know, in the state police, two troopers were interviewing him in his dorm room at Atherton. Uh, and... And they looked at that, and they saw that, and they asked him about it, and he said, oh, I just thought it was a neat saying. You know, and then he, he confessed casually that he regularly carried a knife, uh, but he used it to cut cheese, you know, and they even put him on the lie detector, uh, you know, and he passed with flying colors. And so they let him go, and he, he vanished into the National Security Agency for many years. Uh, and he worked for them? Yes, he did, yeah, yeah. And uh, even as late as, like, around 2006 or 2007, uh, one of the state police investigators, uh, not Trooper Barrows, uh, tried to get information out of the NSA, you know, about him. Uh, filed a Freedom of Information Act request, which they just blew off, you know. And, and I've, I've seen all the documentation, you know, on that. And uh, they wanted to know about his, his record with the NSA. Now, supposedly there was a settlement. I was never able to find out, you know, what it said. But, but I never saw any reason, you know, I mean... He wasn't arrested for a reason. There was just nothing there. It was just a lot of, a lot of smoke. So he disappeared into the... Uh, into the NSA, yeah. Um, you know, today lives in uh, suburban <coughs> Washington, uh, you know, and, but, you know, I talked to him once on the phone. He said, I don't want to talk about this anymore. He said, it's been kind of a tar baby uh, for me, you know, and, but there are still members of the, retired members of the state police who firmly believe that, you know, he should have been arrested, but they never did. So in 1969, Penn State, what mm -hmm. was the college like? What was the atmosphere? It was very different. Uh, there were fewer students than today. There were about 26,000 students, nearly all of them white. Uh, there were maybe two to 300, uh, you know, black students at Penn State at the time, you know, 1% approximately. Uh, 
and, and some of those were, were foreign students. Uh, you know, and, and so in the late 1960s, there was a very active uh, SDS, Students for a Democratic Society chapter there. There were black student organizations that were pursuing the civil rights issue, you know, uh, and, and demanding that, that Penn State you know, do a better job of, of bringing in black students. You know, and, so, and then, of course, there was also the Vietnam War you know, going on. Uh, and there were you know, loud and noisy and even sometimes violent you know, uh, demonstrations against the war you know, by SDS and their supporters. You know, and so the president of Penn State, you know, Eric Walker, you know, was, who was a big fan of J. Edgar Hoover, although, as I discovered accidentally in a, a FOIA request, Hoover had a, a confidential informant in Walker's office at Penn State. Uh, you know, he was not identified in the paper. His name was, was blocked out. But, uh, you know, so it was, this, it was that kind of a place. I mean, there was, there was a very tense, you know, campus. Uh, uh, I mean, there were conservative students, too. I mean, uh, you know, when President Nixon and, and Pat Nixon arrived by helicopter, uh, you know, one day early, I think it was in 1969, to attend his uncle's funeral, who had been on the Penn State agriculture faculty, you know, they, they came out as a welcoming committee, and it wasn't an ironic welcoming committee. I mean, they were really happy to see President Nixon there, you know, but, but other students, you know, were, you know, as, as far to the left as they were to the, the center right. Were Betsy Ardsma or any of the other main characters in your book involved in the campus protests at the time? Betsy was, uh, she was kind of, a, she was a Eugene McCarthy supporter, Senator Eugene McCarthy uh, supporter, and, uh, and she was kind of in that, in that group. She was uh, not a member of SDS. Uh, you know, Trooper Simmers, who was an undercover officer, said that, that her name never appeared on any of the, the lists of uh, SDS members that he had seen. Uh, and and she, this wasn't her, her thing. She was a very earnest, you know, outward looking, uh, you know, young, young woman who was concerned about, you know, bad things happening in the world. And in the, uh, in the moratorium uh, demonstrations that took place nationwide in, in November of 69, just a few weeks before she was murdered, she did uh, participate in, in one of the teach-ins uh, uh, talking about, uh, you know, black authors and the war in Vietnam. How did she end up going to Penn State from having grown up in Michigan? Well, that's an interesting part of uh, the story, uh, how she got there. Um, she uh, uh, had, in her senior year at University of Michigan uh, in 68-69, uh, she had pursued a, a long-time dream of applying to the Peace Corps. You know, uh, she had been uh, you know, thinking about helping people in, in, in foreign countries you know, ever since she heard stories from missionaries who came to her uh, Reformed Church in Holland, Michigan, uh, you know, when she was a, a younger teenager. And, uh, and so she applied to the Peace Corps, was accepted, uh, and I, you know, it's generally believed that she was headed for Sierra Leone. And uh, her boyfriend, uh, David Wright, was very upset about this. And, uh, and he basically told her, well, if, if you go off on this, this two-year hitch, you know, I may not be there, you know, when you get back. You know, and, uh, and this was a serious relationship uh, she had. And so she thought about it and thought about it and thought about it, you know, from about, you know, February of, of 69 through the end of the summer of 69, and, uh, and finally decided that she would, would give up the Peace Corps and, uh, in, to keep her, her boyfriend. And she was, a, she was a very early feminist in many ways. I mean, she wanted to be a doctor initially, which was unusual at that time. I mean, only 7% of medical students in 1965 in America were women. So, but uh, she wasn't always a very successful feminist. You know, uh, she, she sometimes kind of gave in to the societal pressures that, that any woman of that, that time, you know, would have faced. And she probably accomplished more than, than many did, but she still had her bad days, you know, too. And, so then it became a question of where she would go to graduate school. She had done well in the English department at University of Michigan, and Michigan had a wonderful, you know, nationally renowned you know, graduate program in English. But her parents and her uncle and aunt were adamant that she not go stay in Ann Arbor, uh, where the University of Michigan is. And that was because that there was a serial killer operating uh, in there in the spring and summer of 1969, murdering uh, seven or eight you know, uh, women students from uh, U of M and Eastern Michigan University in that general, general area. And it, it terrified the campus, terrified the state. I mean, it was, it was publicized all around the state, you know, if you look at the newspapers from that time. And 
the killer uh, targeted pretty brunettes. Betsy was a pretty brunette. Uh, now, she was much taller than, than uh, the co-ed killer's victims. Uh, who They tended to be between 5'0 and 5'4, and she was 5'10, I believe, 5'8, uh, and uh, so much taller. But that's not a distinction that a scared parent is going to make, you know, when they hear that the killer targets pretty brunettes. And, uh, and she was worried enough about it, about being killed, that she even uh, talked to uh, one of her roommates about what kind of sermon she wanted preached at her funeral if she was you know, murdered by the co-ed killer. Uh, so for that reason, uh, she decided to follow David Wright to Penn State. Uh, David had been accepted to, uh, the, at that time, fairly new Penn State College of Medicine in Hershey. And then she applied uh, fairly late to uh, the Penn State graduate English program and was accepted. And that's how she ended up at Penn State uh, in the, the fall of 69. Now, the murder takes place in the uh, Petit Library. Can you describe it, what it was like then, and is it still like that? Um, back then, uh, the, the stacks of the library, which is essentially where the books are kept, uh, were, was kind of this subterranean you know, labyrinth. You know, it, it had been built in stages over a, a period of decades. Uh, it was very easy to get lost in there. The, it was dimly lit. Uh, you know, you descended from the main floor on, on this tiny narrow staircase that was kind of more suited to a lighthouse than a library. And, uh, and you were down there, and it was very easy to get lost. You know, it was easy to suddenly encounter somebody, you know, that you didn't even realize was there because the, they had all these floor-to-ceiling, you know, book stacks. And they, they were fairly, the aisle be, aisles between them were fairly narrow, so uh, narrow enough that two people could not pass at the same time unless one of them turned sideways. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a scary place to begin with. Is it still like that? In, in many ways it is. I mean, certainly the layout is, is exactly, you know, the same, although some things may have been moved around a little bit, but it's still claustrophobic, you know, you know narrow aisles. The lighting is somewhat better, uh, my, my wife says, who was a student there from 79 to 83. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, but basically it's the same. Could anybody come and go? Yes, they could. Uh, unlike some libraries which have closed stacks and you ask a librarian to retrieve a book for you, Penn State stacks had, had pretty much always uh, been open. So you just looked in the card catalog uh, for, for the book you wanted to find, and then you headed on down those narrow little staircases into the, the labyrinth of the stacks. Did you have to be a student to use it? No, you didn't. Anybody could go down there. Uh, there was no security uh, whatsoever. Um, and... In fact, at that time, in 69, the director of the library had, was getting increasingly scared and worried that something really bad was about to happen. There had been a number of incidents, you know, mostly of a sexual you know, nature you know, down there. And, and he had pleaded with the director of campus security, uh, Colonel William Pelton, to assign you know, uh, members of the campus patrol there permanently uh, all the hours that the library was open. Pelton refused. He said, I can't give you any special priority over any other building, you know, on this campus. They went back and forth, back and forth, you know, on this. And, and there were incidents, there were, there were bombs set, there were fires set, uh, you know, and many bomb threats called in, uh, and then there were all these, these sexual assault type, type incidents. And, and so the, the library uh, finally said, well, let's look at our budget and let's see if we can find enough money to, to hire some security guards. And that's what they did. But they only had enough money to hire two part-timers and they only were on duty from, I believe it was 8 p.m. to closing, you know, which was around, around midnight. And the murder happened at 5 of 5. Was there much crime on the campus at the time? Crime on the campus, uh, it's hard to say because they didn't keep good statistics then. But you get the impression that, that no... There was, there was not generally, you know, a lot of crime. But in the library, like I said, there were a, n a number of things going on that left the, the library staff quite worried. You say here the stacks were a haven for a variety of sexual activities that the state police termed vice. They were popular places for gay cruising, especially among gay teenagers who couldn't get served at the My Oh My Bar downtown. Yes. Uh, what kind of security did the campus have? Did, did, did town police patrol it or state police? It was a strange setup. Um, the... Uh, the State College Borough Police had no jurisdiction on the Penn State campus. You know, and, and State College 
uh, not completely, but pretty much surrounds, you know, the Penn State campus. So the state police had jurisdiction uh, on, on the Penn State campus. From, uh, they were located in uh, Rockview next to the, the state prison, you know, up there, uh, about a nine or ten mile, you know, drive from, uh, you know, from one, to, one place to the other. So, but they didn't patrol regularly. Now, Penn State had uh, a security force called the Campus Patrol, uh, but they were essentially untrained security guards. Uh, they were not sworn police officers, as that term is known. They, uh, they could detain people but could not uh, you know, prosecute a case against them. They would have to bring in the state police to prosecute a case. Uh, and they had very little training at the time uh, unless they had gotten it somewhere else. They tended to be you know, mostly middle-aged guys. There was also an auxiliary student patrol that mostly did traffic con you know, control at football games and, and that sort of thing. So it was, it was not an ideal situation. Um, it's better today, although Sergeant Keebler told me you know, the other day, he said, you know, this is a, like a city you know, of 46,000 or, or more, yet it still had, it does not have a police department worthy of a city of that size. So set the stage for the murder. It was Black Friday, the day after mm -hmm. Thanksgiving. How many students were, were still on campus? Didn't everybody go home? Not everybody went, went home. Um, you know, the foreign students, the, you know, the kids who lived a long distance away, or graduate students like Betsy who were under deadline pressure to, to finish uh, important papers, you know, for a, for a graduate course. So, I mean, it's hard to say what the exact number on campus was. Now, in the library, this, the, the numbers of, of people in the library you know, on that weekend were, were down somewhat, but I, I think a lot of the students who were on campus went to the library, you know, that weekend. Uh, so... She was there, you know, she had, um, had gone to uh, the library, uh, you know, to, to work on this paper for English uh, 501 uh, with Professors Messerol and uh, Joukowsky. Uh, it's basically a, a course that teaches uh, new graduate students how to be scholars, you know, how to, how to do research, scholarly research. And, uh, and she had stopped at Nicholas Joukowsky's office on the way over there, uh, and he had asked her to retrieve a book that she had cited as a source uh, for uh, a paper he had done, she had done for him earlier uh, in the semester. And so she said, sure, you know, and, and she, she went there and went down into the stack. She was, well, she was seen, you know, along the way by other students, you know, in her class, because many of them, many of the students in the English 501 class, including Maurer, you know, were there. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, at about five of five, she uh, encountered her killer, and I, and like I said, I in the book I believe that to have been Richard Hafner, based on everything you know that is known. And uh, Hafner had a hair trigger temper w where women were concerned. You see this throughout his life, uh, and and he liked his porn. Uh, and the state police found an expensive Dutch porn book, uh, meaning it was printed in the Netherlands, uh, where pornography had been legalized uh, not too much earlier than that, and. Uh, and this was abandoned, you know, at, at one of the carrels, one of the desks, uh, you know, near, near the crime site. And about five of five, there were, there were two other students uh, nearby, Merrily Erdley and a Mozambican student by the name of Joao Wafinda. Uh, and, and a little bit further away was a man visiting his son on campus that day, Richard Allen. Uh, he was a writer for uh, American Heritage magazine and, and wrote books about covered bridges, you know, uh, and... He was using the copier, and uh, and so at about five of five, uh, they hear what sounds like like a fist hitting a chest. That was the only noise. You know, there was no scream, there was no you know cry of terror, you know, no no argument, anything like that. Uh, and and they were within you know twenty to thirty feet you know of of where the, the crime took place, and. And all of a sudden, they hear the sound of books crashing to the floor. And a few seconds later, this man comes running out of, out of, out of the stacks. You know, he was tall, you know, about 6'1", six, about six you know, uh, maybe about 180 pounds, wearing a sport jacket. Uh, you know, not looking more actually like a professor than, than a student, you know, at that time. Although students still dressed fairly nicely, you know, in 1969 at, at, at Penn State. But in any case... He looked to be in his young 20s, and he comes running out of the stacks right past Merrily Erdley and Joao Wafinda. And he says, somebody better help that girl, kind of, you know, you know nudging, you know, indicating back. But it wasn't going to be him. He kept on going. 
And uh, Wafinda, whose native language was, was Portuguese, and, and he knew some French you know, uh, also, his English was so-so. He had only learned English after uh, coming to the United States as a, as a student. He thinks that, uh, you know, the, the man says, we've got to help the girl. And so he takes off, you know, following, following him. And, uh, and they go around, around the, you know, the, the, what they call the core uh, area of the stacks, uh, you know, once. And then uh, Hafner vanishes, uh, or the man, I believe, was Hafner, you know, vanishes. And, uh, and Sergeant Keebler believes that the man running out of the stacks was the killer. Uh, and, uh, and so... Hafner then just disappears. He probably went out the, the west entrance of, of, uh, of Petit Library, and, uh, and then it was, it, was, it was dark. It was dark enough, you know, that people saw, people think they remember seeing a man running across the front of Petit Library, but no one knows for sure, you know, whether it was him. You say in the book that uh, Hafner, uh, later that evening or shortly after that, knocked on the door of one of his professors? Yeah, about an hour uh, afterwards, he, he shows up at the home, uh, in uh, kind of a, the southwest corner of State College of Professor Lauren Wright. Uh, Professor Wright uh, was his thesis advisor. Uh, Hafner was a, a geology uh, graduate student. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, Wright had not too long ago signed off on, on Hafner's master's thesis. And he's, he's frantic and out of sorts. And, and the first thing he wants to know when, when Wright opens the door is, was there anything in the paper about that girl being killed in the library? You know, and it's only been an hour, you know, and there actually was no news coverage until about 11 o'clock, you know, that night, uh, you know, when the, uh, the Altoona paper, uh, or, the, or the, the State College edition of the Altoona paper uh, heard something from the coroner that there had been a murder of a, of a co-ed. And, uh, and he stays with Wright, you know, for a while, and, and, uh, and then, he, then he leaves as mysteriously, you know, as he arrives. Uh, now, Wright... In later years, Wright was suspicious because, at least eventually, he became suspicious. He knew that Hafner regularly carried a knife, uh, and Hafner had carried a knife uh, since he was a student at J.P. McCaskey High School in Lancaster uh, in the early uh, 1960s. Uh, and Hafner carried a knife for self-protection uh, because of his sexuality. Uh, he was he was perceived as as gay, uh, and in, more accurately, he was a, a boy-oriented pedophile who sought out women as cover for what he was. And, uh, and so Wright doesn't say anything. He doesn't say anything for seven years. Uh, and at, seven years later, in, in the summer of 1976, Hafner comes back. He's, he's upset with Wright. He, he's acting in a threatening manner. Wright feels that he's, he's being threatened. And he goes to his dean, Charles Hostler, uh, in the geology department, and, and pours out this story uh, about, you know, Hafner showing up at his house, uh, how he regularly carried a knife, and most importantly, that he believed that, that Hafner may well have been the, the murderer of Betsy Yardsma. Hostler then does the right thing. He goes to the university general counsel, uh, Delbert McQuaid. McQuaid, enormously influential insider, you know, at Penn State, uh, as people told me, he was, he was there at all the important meetings. You know, he had immediate access to President John Oswald, you know, at the time. Oswald had succeeded, uh, you know, the, Eric, or, you know, the previous president. And, uh, uh, and so he tells, he goes to McQuaid, he tells the story, and nothing happens. Uh, you know, there, I talked to Sergeant Keebler, you know, during my interviews. I said, did you ever hear anything, you know, about this? And the answer was, was no, we knew nothing about it. And I even found a, a, a news clipping from November of 1976, a few months after this happened, where um, it was a feature that the AP ran where people could write in with questions about things in the news. And, uh, and somebody had written in about whether, what had ever become of, of this girl that was killed you know, in the library. And Keebler responded to this for the AP, and he said, we know nothing more about this than we knew on the night of the murder. And that is not, even though Keebler, by his profession, is a very reticent individual, uh, you know, he keeps things close to the vest, this is not the kind of statement about somebody who had just been given a hot tip, you know, about, you know, this murder that had bedeviled them, you know, for so long. 
But you did say that Penn State uh, paid for part of the investigation, part of the cost of the investigation of the murder? They did, uh, they did pay for part of it. Um, you know, the investigation cost about a quarter of a million dollars in 1969 dollars. You know, uh, you know they, they allowed the university airplane to be used to fly in this hypnotist, uh, this Hazleton dentist that they brought in to, to hypnotize Joa Wafinda and Marilee Erdley, you know, the two post-murder witnesses, uh, to try to see if they could pull more out of their, their brains about, you know, what had happened. Uh, ultimately, it didn't, it didn't do a whole lot, but, but they did things like that, you know, and you have to remember there were, there were 40 troopers on, on the campus for five or six weeks. You know, they interviewed more than 2,500 students and faculty trying to, to solve this horrible, horrible murder. And, and I mean, to go back to what we started talking about originally, that is why I, I'm just very suspicious when, they, when Penn State says, we don't know where these documents are. You know, uh, there should be, like I said, there should be that many, you know, documents, you know. I have to ask you about this one woman who was involved in the investigation, and uh, you refer to her as Miss Marple. Yes. Who was she? Mary Willard. Uh, she was uh, uh, an unmarried, uh, you know, woman of, of late middle age. Uh, back then, they would have called her an old maid. You know, uh, she was a very, success, very skilled CSI crime scene investigator. Uh, back when there wasn't even a name for what she did. And she called it criminalistics. Criminalistics. Yes. Uh, she, uh, you know, she was just great. I mean, she, she really was a pioneer you know, in this field. And, and outside police had been coming to her for help you know, since the, the time of prohibition, when they would bring in you know, hooch you know, to be analyzed chemically. Yeah, I want to read you. you say she had been doing criminalistics since 1932 when law enforcement agents brought her bootleg liquor for analysis in the waning days of prohibition. And she had been called as an expert witness in the trial of Dr. Sam Shepard, who yes. was the model for the, the TV fugitive. show The Fugitive. Yes, yeah. yeah. And I found an interview uh, you know, with her where she, she talked about you know, Shepard and how she felt that, that he was innocent because she had, she had carefully analyzed. And I, I, figure, I forget if it, you know, the, the killer was left-handed and, and, and Shepard was right-handed or vice versa, you know, and, and a number of, of other things. And, and Shepard did eventually you know, get off. He was cleared. Uh, and one more thing you say, say um, former district attorney Charles Brown, later a county judge, said she was an expert on anything and everything. Handwriting, she was the expert. Blood analysis, she was the expert. You name it, she was the expert. And what was her job at Penn State? At she was a chemistry professor. Uh, and uh, her father uh, had also been on the, the Penn State faculty. In fact, she had been born in a house on the Penn State campus. Uh, I believe it was in 1898 or, or, or thereabouts. And, and uh, and it was definitely a, you know, a, a true member of, of the Penn State family. Uh, Willard Building at Penn State is named after her father. Uh, and uh, so, you know, she had been there all her life, and that's where she lived out her life. I have to read you one more thing. Joe Willard, her nephew, uh, recalled one of his earliest memories was driving her to the Scranton area so she could pick up a badly charred set of human remains. He loaded them in the trunk of the car and drove her back to State College in her laboratory on the first floor of Pond. She was unflappable. Yes, she was. I mean, it was just another, another job, you know, for her. Uh, and uh, it's unfortunate. I, when I was interviewing him, I thought, well, I wonder if she kept records. And it turned out that after she died, they, they just cleaned out her house and all the records were, were destroyed. But, uh, you know, uh, she's just a, she's a made-for-TV character. <laughs> so what was her involvement? What'd she do? She, uh, she was called in, the, uh, a little background, uh, the, first, the case was probably lost in the first 90 minutes uh, after the, the crime occurred. Uh, the campus patrol, uh, you know, was, was dispatched when they heard something had happened. Uh, there was no effort to control the crime scene. Uh, students, high-ranking university officials, including, you know, the president, uh, walked through the crime scene to, to see where it had happened. Uh, the library itself, who thought that, she had only, that Betsy had only fainted, uh, or perhaps had an epileptic seizure, uh, after she was taken off to, to Rittenauer Health Center, where she was pronounced dead almost immediately, they had a janitor mop the crime scene. But, you know, there's a pool of urine there, and, and so they just had it all mopped up. You know, things were moved around. The crime scene was a total mess by the time the state police, but Trooper Simmers arrived 90 minutes uh, after the crime had occurred. I want to ask you about one more thing, and that's her funeral, because apparently people were still angry about her funeral um, 40 years later. Holland is a, is a Dutch town, uh, not Pennsylvania Dutch. We're talking Dutch from the Netherlands. Uh, 
it had been settled by conservative uh, Dutch religious dissidents in, in 1847 and, and thereafter. Uh, they were, uh, I mean, today we think of the Netherlands as a very liberal, you know, place, you know, with legal pot, legal prostitution, everything like that. But, you know, at the time, there were very strong Calvinist, you know, religious sects. And, and the, the settlers that came from the Netherlands in, in uh, 1847 were among, among those. They were going to America to find a place where they could live out their religion with no contamination you know, by the outside world. Now, Holland became more, much more moderate over the years. Half of it did, anyway. Uh, and the other half w remained very Calvinistic. Uh, and at her funeral, the, the minister, uh, Reverend Gordon Van Ostenburg, uh, I went to high school and college with his daughter, uh, he preached a very typical Calvinist sermon uh, about how we need to all celebrate that she is entering into heaven, you know, uh, and which was, you know, fine. It was a sincere sermon on his part. Her friends hated it. Uh, you know, they wanted something said about, you know, the loss to the world of this, this wonderful, talented, you know, young woman, uh, you know, and instead, you know, they, they get this sermon about how we should all be happy that, that she's gone to heaven, you know. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing, you know, their religion. It's just it was a very different, it was a, a religion of the past, an, an attitude of the past. And Betsy's friends were people of, of the present, young people looking forward who, who wanted a life in the world, who wanted a good life in the world, you know, and, and they just were, they were angry, you know, and, it, and I, could, I could tell that they were, were really angry because 40 years later, they were still angry about it. So how many dead ends did the police come across when they were uh, doing their investigation? I mean, how many suspects did they have and finally conclude that that person wasn't You know, I never got an exact number. It kind of came down. I mean, they, they focused on Maurer, you know, uh, almost to the exclusion of, every, of everybody else. But they investigated many, many leads, many interesting, you know, uh, you know, leads. Uh, there was there was a long time rumor, you know, that that she uh, that she had been the victim of a killer who was killing the first student in the university telephone directory, and she was with a name that spelled A A R D S M A. She was the first. Although funny enough, in her hometown, she was not. There was an Alderink A A L that was came before Ardsma. But uh, but in any case, you know, there was there was that rumor. There was the rumor that that she was a, an undercover drug agent, that her parents were undercover drug agents, which anybody who knew her parents just thought that was ludicrous. I mean, unless they were living, you know, like this true lies type of uh, existence, if you remember that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, uh, you know, but, but no, you know, her father was, uh, was, uh, worked in tax collections for the state of Michigan. Her mother was, uh, you know, a, a basically a homemaker, you know, and, but uh, there was a rumor that, that she was a, had been a nude model for the art department, uh, and you know, and that that it, her killing had somehow grown out of that. Sergeant Keebler said they spent a, a, a lot of time track, trying to track that one down. He was left with a very jaded opinion of art students, uh, you know. After that, Richard Hafner, the person you suspect was the killer, did he have a, any kind of relationship? Did he know Betsy Artsma? He. Uh, went out with her on a very casual basis, uh, perhaps three times, you know, like coffee, maybe ice cream at the creamery, uh, maybe even bowling, you know, once. Betsy, although she had this relationship with David Wright, throughout her life, she had been open to casual friendships with men. And it's clear that this is all she ever saw, you know, Hafner as, as a, a, another in a long line of, of casual male you know, friends, you know, she didn't see anything of it. Hafner, unfortunately, did. Uh, and, and she eventually, uh, you know, told him this was not going to continue after about, you know, three times, you know, she told her family that, that he was a creep. And, uh, and so, you know, they, yeah, there was, a, you know, they, they did know each other. Uh, they both lived in Atherton Hall, which was first, Penn State's first co-ed dorm. In fact, I think that was the first year for a co-ed dorm. Um, Hafner, incidentally, had briefly been Maurer's roommate. That's another interesting, you know, uh, connection here. Uh, you know, but, um, yeah, they did, they did know each other. Was Hafner a creep? He was very definitely a creep. Uh, he was a, a, a bad pedophile, you know, and he had been uh, caught, you know, more, on more than one occasion, uh, beginning 
uh, when he was a student at Franklin and Marshall College uh, in the, the early 1960s. Uh, and probably the, the most notorious incidents were as a Boy Scout, assistant scoutmaster uh, in Lancaster there at Sacred Heart Church. Uh, he was eventually, you know, cashiered from from the Boy Scouts, although he there was there were no charges, you know, brought. Not, not uh, reported to the police. No, no, no reporting to the police. Uh, then in the summer of August of '65, he took two young boys. I think they were like eight and ten, maybe ten and twelve. I forget, but uh, he took them to Ocean City uh, for a week, uh, Ocean City, Maryland, for a week to show them a good time. This was obviously a very much more trusting era, you know. Uh, but he always looked for sons of single moms, you know, or who had some other type of dysfunctional family. You know, not that all single moms are dysfunctional, but, but who didn't have a, you know, often a strong father, you know, there. And, uh, and so, and he molested both of them, you know, down in, in Ocean City. You know, they came back, they told their mom, who was, who was furious and upset, she complained to Hafner's boss uh, at the Lancaster Recreation Commissioner, uh, a guy by the name of Phil Bomberger. Bomberger, you know, to his credit, you know, tried to get to the bottom of this, you know, and, uh, and he talked to, to Hafner's uh, priest, although Hafner was a, a nominal Catholic at, at best. That's where the, the news about the thing about the Boy Scout troop came out, because it was the, boy, the church's Boy Scout troop. Um, talked to his, his first family physician. Uh, talked to, uh, you know, a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist, you know, said, you must not report this boy to the police. That will ruin his life. And see, it was, it, was a, it was a different attitude toward pedophilia back then, you know, and, and Philip Jenkins, uh, a Penn State professor, uh, he even wrote a book about this, about the, the stages that America has gone through in its attitude toward pedophilia. And at that time, in the, the early to mid-1960s, we were still in kind of this, this libertarian, live and let live, it's embarrassing, but it's not a crime. You know, uh, you know, tell them, you know, go and sin no more and, and, and that sort of thing. And um, he was never reported to the police that anyone knows about. Uh, so he got away with all this. In fact, they sent him off to grad school at Penn State with, with orders to, he promised that he would get psychiatric help. There's no evidence he ever did. Uh, you know, and, and so there he was. You know, I, I was never able to find any, any, further incidents at Penn State, but, you know, given the way pedophiles are, probably something happened. He was a geologist? He was a geologist, yeah. He, uh, he got his master's and his Ph.D. Uh, at Penn State. The, uh, he actually got the master's degree uh, a couple of weeks after, after the murder, and he stayed on, you know, although very rarely on campus, it was mostly off-campus study, to get his Ph.D., you know, and Lauren Wright, his thesis advisor, had these suspicions, but, you know, nobody said anything. How yeah. many in incidents, times in the, uh, in the course of the investigation did they come close and just miss something obvious? I'm not sure if they ever, ever really did, you know, mm -hmm. and, I, and I blame Lauren Wright, you know, for that. It was a moral failing on his part. Um, it's possible Hafner had something on him uh, that he wasn't willing to even talk about, you know, until after his wife died in, in 1990. Uh, but Lauren Wright, although he, he talked to people about what he thought Hafner had done. Um, you know, he, uh, in 19, uh, around 1991, he, he ran into one of his former uh, students who also knew Hafner well uh, at a geologic conference out in Las Vegas. You know, and Dan Stevens, you know, uh, says to the, you know, Professor, Haf or Professor uh, Wright, uh, you know, would you ever hear anything from Rick Hafner? And Wright gets this kind of funny look on his face and, and starts pouring out this story, you know, about what had happened that night, you know, and how he thought that, that Hafner had killed, you know, Betsy Arzma. Uh, you know, when, when a woman by the name of, of Pamela West uh, came to Penn State in 1986 and she started hearing stories about, you know, this geology student who had, had run from the library, who had showed up at his, his professor's house, you know. Uh, she was going to write a book about it, but, but never did. She ended up writing a, a, a disguised novel sort of about, you know, the case. Uh, but but she, she had heard these stories, and I have to think that it was probably, you know, that Lauren Wright probably told more than one, you know, person about his suspicions. But he never picked up the phone and called the state police, you know, and... And as we've seen in the Sandusky thing, you know, 
you know, Penn State just had this look the other way attitude. You know, they, things went on. There was a there was another pedophile professor scandal in 1981 involving a, a, a geosciences professor by the name of Antonio Lasaga, who was arrested in, in uh, one of the surrounding suburban townships uh, around State College for uh, for molesting you know two boys. His colleagues helped him get off. You know, they they persuaded the the families to drop the charges. You know. A couple years later, uh, you know, Penn State sends Antonio Lasaga off to Yale, where he's, you know, well liked and and you know appreciated. You know, he's, and in 1998, I believe it was 1999, he was arrested, you know, by the FBI on child pornography charges. Had like 150,000 images of, uh, of child pornography on his university computer, uh, and then state officials in Connecticut arrest him for molesting a boy that he had met in an inner city mentoring program uh, in New Haven. Uh, and he was sent to prison uh, for 15 years on the federal charges and 20 years on the state charges. He finishes his federal term uh, you know, next February, I believe it is. And then I don't know, I assume he'll have to be transferred to Connecticut to finish out the state term. But, but yet another pedophile scandal, you know, which everybody's forgotten about now, but it was very definitely there and I've seen the documents. Well, Hafner did get arrested and charged with something to do with pedophilia, mm -hmm. although it was, a, it was not a direct charge. Oh, yeah. It was uh, 1975, uh, summer of 75. He was uh, arrested in the city of Lancaster, where he lived, uh, for molesting two boys that worked in his, uh, what they called the rock shop. Hafner had this, uh, this business of assembling these, these little souvenir uh, rock and mineral sample uh, boxes that... Uh, he sold to the Smithsonian, which then resold them uh, in, his, in their gift shop. And, uh, and so uh, Hafner employed a lot of neighborhood boys uh, in his, his shop. And, and two of them in particular, he singled out and he molested them. And uh, they, their parents eventually found out and, and complained to the city police there, who arrested Hafner uh, in August of, of 1975. Uh, and the, the whole the old story is told, you know, in, in the book there. But the next day, his parents bailed him out. You know, his parents, especially his mother, were always extremely supportive of, you know, what he was, you know, of what he was. And, and, uh, and so the next day, he's, he's blithely working in his rock shop. And he's, he's outside in the, the alley between the rock shop and, and his house on Nevin Street in Lancaster. And his mother had seen the stories in, in both editions of the Lancaster paper about him, him being arrested, was just furious at, at the embarrassment, you know, to the family. And she just sees him out there and she just loses it. You know, she runs out, you know, she, she confronts him, you know, in the alley there and, and, says, you know, and says, you're, you're doing it again. You know, why don't you just kill me the way you killed that girl at Penn State? And... Uh, you know, and then they, they go back and forth, and then, then Hafner kind of pushes her back you know, into the house and, and then starts screaming at her, you know, you know to, to shut up and not do this in public. Well, there were neighbors who heard this? It wasn't, it wasn't a neighbor. It was his, his own cousin uh, who was working in the rock shop, 15 years old, named Chris Hafner. And, uh, and, and Chris overhears the whole thing, you know, and... It imprints in his mind. He doesn't do anything about it at the time because he's 15 and, and he, he likes the money he makes working for Rick, you know. And, and uh, but in the in the weeks that followed, you know, Hafner knew that, that Chris had overheard, you know, and, and and Hafner tries to persuade Chris that he really hadn't heard what he had heard, you know, and and then starts disparaging, you know, this girl that was killed at Penn State, you know, how she was. She was just out to get a husband like every other, you know, you know woman. Uh, you know, he's sounding exactly like a, a jilted, you know, would-be suitor, you know, and, and uh, although that status was really only in his own mind. But, uh, uh, and so you know, when, when Hafner became known, you know, uh, started becoming known again in 2010, uh, you know, eight years after his death, Chris came forward and started talking you know, about what he remembered from back then, and he talked to me at length uh, in a couple of interviews and in subsequent conversations you know, about his, his cousin, you know, what he was, and, and he, he said that he himself was molested by, you know, by his cousin you know, uh, on one occasion, uh, and it was, uh, it was just a very strange situation. I mean, uh, Hafner was kind of like, like Fagan in, in Oliver Twist. Uh, you know, Fagan basically was you know, a child molester in many ways, you know, and, uh, 
And, and he, Hafner would have these, these young boys around him. It was kind of like Charles Manson's family, but involving mostly teenage, you know, boys, you know, and, and he molested many of them. You know, he had his favorites of, of one time or another, you know, and he just was uh, a train wreck of, of a human being. What was he like to be around? Well, he could be charming. You know, he could be very persuasive. You know, he was intelligent. Um, but he could also be just plain weird. You know, he was, he was uh, you know, and as I mentioned before, he could be very violent, you know, when a woman crossed him. You know, there are incidents of this throughout his life. Uh, and most notoriously, in 1998, when he uh, got in a confrontation with a woman, uh, Catherine Schuyler, uh, outside a liquor store in, in Wilmington, Delaware. And, uh, you know, Hafner had this old dog uh, that traveled with him. Uh, and, and he left the dog in the shopping cart uh, when he went inside the store. And then along comes Catherine Schuyler and several other women who see this dog apparently abandoned there. And they're talking among themselves, what are we going to do, you know, about this? And, and so they just, one of them says, well, I'll take him to my, my vet. We'll put him in the kennel there until we can figure out, you know, whose dog he is. Hafner comes out, flips out, starts screaming at him, and they're screaming back at him. And uh, he follows Catherine Schuyler to her car. She gets in her car, and he starts banging on the car, you know, with this bottle of, of Jameson's whiskey that he he just purchased, you know. And then finally, you know, goes away to his car. Well, then Catherine Schuyler makes a mistake, and she goes. She uh, decides she's going to get his, his license number. So she drives over, you know, near his car to copy down the license number. Uh, doesn't pay attention to the fact that her window is rolled down. And, uh, and all of a sudden, Hafner is, is on her. He pulls her out through the window of the car and starts banging her face on the, you know, the, the car. She ended up with $32,000 in, in dental damage. Uh, Hafner is, is arrested. Uh, a Tasty Cake driver saw what was happening and, and intervened. You know, and Hafner runs away. But, uh, but they did have the license number. and. Uh, and so he was arrested, gets 30 days in jail, you know, and, and that's it. And they never figured it out. You know, they never figured out that he had this, this awful, you know, past. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, he, he could be seemingly a nice, intelligent, erudite, you know, person. Uh, he was able to, um, you know, get people like, you know, lawyer Richard Sprague of Philadelphia to represent him. Yeah, I want to ask about that because Richard Sprague was a pretty famous lawyer and mm -hmm. probably not, didn't, work for cheap. How did he manage to get Richard Sprague as his defense attorney for a, for a pedophilia charge? It's, um, it's generally believed, and, and one of Hafner's other lawyers, later on lawyers, told me that, that Hafner appraised gems for the Medellin cartel. Uh, he was a, a trained gem appraiser, uh, and, and Hafner, uh, when he actually, actually hired uh, lawyer Ken Richmond to sue Sprague, he, Hafner loved to sue people, you know, and, who crossed him. And, uh, and, and, and Richmond says, okay, but how are you, you going to pay me? You know, and, and Hafner shows up with a shoebox full of cash, of 20, 25000 some dollars in cash to pay Richmond's retainer. You know, and, and Richmond says, okay, but, you know, where'd you get this? And, then, and Hafner then tells the story about how he appraised emeralds you know, for the Medellin cartel, which were a currency of the drug trade at that time in the, in the 1980s. And uh, so, but anyway, he... He had money. I mean, he portrayed, portrayed himself as a pauper and often uh, got pauper status when he was filing these lawsuits against, you know, people, uh, you know, in, in courts. But, um, but he had plenty of money when he, when he really needed it. And, and, you know, but he ended up stiffing, you know, Sprague for, for quite a, a large sum of money because he just didn't like to pay, pay people if he didn't, he didn't need to. So did, was he found not guilty? Sprague, you know, who is, who is a brilliant lawyer, um, found a an avenue to an appeal uh, on the grounds that, that when Hafner went on trial, you know, for, those, for molesting those two boys in Lancaster, a trial that ended in a mistrial because uh, one juror would not vote to convict, uh, Sprague uh, persuaded the appellate courts in Pennsylvania that the, the trial judge should have made the jury try longer, you know, and that the fact, and that, that, he, the fact that he had not done that uh, meant that he had actually technically issued a, a, a verdict of acquittal. And so Hafner got off, you know, and, you know, and Sprague got him off. And then Sprague also represented him on 
on a number of other, you know, uh, related and, and sundry issues, like when he, he caused a commotion in the office of the Lancaster, you know, newspapers, uh, you know, once. And, and uh, but eventually they had a falling out, and 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 Sprague, you know, told him to hit the road, and then he then ended up suing Sprague. Did you? Try to interview Richard Sprague. About I this? tried several times. Uh, could never get a never get a response. Uh, you know, I, I called. I you know I faxed you know letters of request and no response. Yeah. So uh, was Hafner living in Lancaster, Lancaster area at the time? This is this later years of his life. Mostly in Lancaster, uh, although in the, the the later years of his life, uh, in in the 1990s up to his death in 2002, he also spent a lot of time. In, uh, in Death Valley, uh, in around the town of, of Shoshone, uh, California, and uh, a little hamlet that's kind of a suburb of Shoshone, uh, Tacopa Hot Springs. And uh, he, uh, he acquired a, a house in, in, uh, in Tacopa uh, basically by, by cheating an elderly couple you know, from, from Nevada who owned the property. Uh, and his intention was to live out his life there. Uh, and uh, for a time, he was he was hoping that one of his his young boyfriends was was going to join him there. In fact, you know, he, he even started adoption uh, proceedings. Uh, that's a whole other sort of story. But uh, it sounds like he was not a very good neighbor. He was not a very good neighbor. And uh, and in, and while living in Lancaster, uh, you know, he this dog that I mentioned, uh, Dudley, was the dog's name. And uh, and he had a bad habit of letting Dudley just run run free, you know, and, you know, Doug, Dudley would, you know, knock over trash cans, he would dig up gardens and everything, and, and, and eventually some of his, his neighbors, you know, filed charges against him with the police and testified against him at the district justice. Well, Hafner didn't like that, and so he went out one night, and, and there were witnesses to this, he went out and, and uh, you know, keyed some cars, he punctured tires of, of the people who had testified, you know, against him, you know, and, uh, but again, he, he, he got off, you know. He always got off with very minor, you know, you know, char offense, you know, fines or whatever. And, and uh, even when he he, you know, raised a serious you know, ruckus on he and his brother, his brother George, uh, you know, had a standoff with police in 1994, you know, at, at the house on, on Nevin Street in Lancaster. You know, uh, George was was nearly as, as disturbed as as Richard was, and and he's also passed on, but. Uh, um, you know, and, and the police came, uh, and, and, and Hafner flipped out when he saw the police, uh, and, you know, was, was shooting, you know, mace, I think it was, or, or pepper spray, you know, at the police, you know, and, um, it was just, I mean, the guy's lucky he wasn't shot to death, you know, I mean, probably, I think the way police sometimes are today, that that might have ended up, you know, with, with one or both brothers, you know, dead, you know, but in any case, no. What's your next book? Everybody asks me that. I, I really don't know. You know, it's uh, just uh, taking a period of rest and relaxation and, and getting my younger daughter into a, a college musical theater program. Is it fun writing books like this? It is. Uh, it's, it's, it's fun, very rewarding, but also it's a lot of hard work, you know, too. Uh, and, uh, you know, this one uh, was harder than most for, for a number of, of reasons. Well, we've been speaking with David DeCook. He is the author of this book, Murder in the Stacks, Penn State, Betsy Ardsma, and the Killer Who Got Away. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. We'd like to hear from you. Our email address is pabooks at pcntv.com. Like us on Facebook to learn more about PA Books.